Welcome to the Teaching Value and Healthcare Learning Network. Join us to hear leaders in the field share practical and tangible advice about how to develop engaging curriculum and health system innovation to train a new generation of healthcare providers from diverse specialties and professions skilled to deliver high value care. With national concerns about rising healthcare costs as well as overuse, underuse, and misuse of medical care, Cost of Care and the ABIM Foundation created the Learning Network as a space to share ideas, educational materials, and strategies in an open forum. Our goal is to discuss ways to get involved, implement, and sustain feasible innovations in teaching value at your institutions. The Teaching Value and Healthcare Learning Network will have a few major components, including monthly webinars that are approximately 15-minute sessions to hear on the ground and national leaders share successful innovations, discussion groups to facilitate sharing ideas, and toolkits to share materials needed for dissemination and innovations. I am Reshma Gupta, the Director of Evaluation and Outreach at Cost of Care, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Today we will be sharing innovations in value and practical components of implementation to discuss how to gain buy-in, change culture, discuss what resources are needed, and to sustain these initiatives. Today we'll be having Dr. Eric Way, who's the Interim Chief Quality Officer at Los Angeles County University of Southern California Medical Center, which is the second largest public health system in the country, and newly the Vice President and Chief Quality Officer across New York Health and Hospitals, which is the largest public health system here in the country. He has led various value improvement initiatives and um, has much more to share with us about how to work specifically with vulnerable populations and low-income individuals in creating culture change and having impact to reduce low-value care. Eric, I'll hand the mic over to you to share some of the work that you've been doing specifically at LA County. All right, thank you, Rishma. Uh, so uh, by introduction, uh, I just recently changed roles from the second largest to the largest safety net system uh, in the country, uh, be talking more specifically about examples from Los Angeles County. So I was at LA County USC Medical Center as the Chief Quality Officer and Associate Medical Director of Quality, Safety, and Risk. And LA County USC is the largest hospital of a four hospital safety net system, um, Department of Health Services for Los Angeles County. 600 bed facility, level one trauma center, a burn unit, the ED annual census, about 175,000 patients. Uh, the change to New York City um, is uh, 11 hospital, uh, I have post acute and 71 ambulatory care uh, system uh, with about twice as many employees. A lot of the same challenges uh, and a lot of the same themes. Uh, but at Los Angeles County, um, some of the things that we think about with value is it's even more important in a resource limited safety net system to think about how much uh, value add you can provide for the patients and their families and the community uh, with those limited resources. So we were fortunate enough to be a grantee uh, in collaboration with Dr. Catherine Sarkeesian, John Moffey at UCLA, as well as the Department of uh, Public Health uh, for choosing wisely through ABIM. And the projects that we worked on at LA County USC included reducing unnecessary antibiotics for uh, viral bronchitis, for um, reducing imaging with CT and MRIs for low back pain, as well as reducing preoperative testing for low risk surgeries and most specifically cataract surgery and ophthalmology. And so there are a lot of still common um, themes. You still have the same medicine. Uh, patients are patients, providers are providers, uh, regardless if you're in a safety net system versus not. Uh, the staff wants to be engaged and empowered and feel like they're part of identifying the problems and the solutions. Uh, and it's still the, the responsibility of leadership to create that cult culture 
in the environment to allow the performance improvement to happen. And so we use the combination of lean methodology as well as the IHI model for improvement. Uh, I'll speak a little bit to the, the cataract surgery um, initiative. And so we engaged both the leadership as well as residents and nurses and mid-level providers in ophthalmology and anesthesiology. We were able to show them the data that with all the preoperative testing that was going on for our cataract patients, none of it was changing the decision to go to surgery or not. Uh, and so really showing them the data um, opened their eyes and gave them accountability and ownership for it. Uh, then asking them how they would address this problem, uh, they decided, you know, we don't need uh, that pre-op visit with the, the preoperative testing. And so over a, a matter of a few months, we were able to completely change that preoperative process and reduce EKGs, chest x-rays, pre-op labs by all over 80%. And being able to stay patient-centered, that meant the difference of six months of lag time between the decision to do surgery and them having actually improved vision. So that's something that they could take home with them is I'm giving my patients six months of improved vision. And, you know, I think we, we always uh, complain about, you know, the, the limitations of the safety net system where we say we can't incentivize people and staff the same way. Uh, but there are a lot of advantages to the safety net system as well. People there tend to be very mission driven, uh, very patient centered, patient focused. And so appealing to their pride as providers, caregivers, uh, showing them the data, nobody um, goes through medical school happy with C's. Uh, so appealing to, you know, this is where the, the national benchmarks are, or this is how you're doing compared to your peers. Um, Nobody wants to be in that middle or bottom uh, groups. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of times if you, if you give them the opportunity to feel engaged and that they can actually make a difference, you know, one success, uh, no matter how small, begets future successes. And so we've done a lot of uh, celebrating wins, no matter how small. And so an example of this would be for our antibiotics for viral bronchitis initiative. Uh, we actually collaborated with Jason Doctor and Aniela Meeker from the Schaefer Center. And uh, they had done and published on a gentle nudge. So having the providers sign an attestation poster that I promised not to prescribe antibiotics unnecessarily. And it had their picture and their signature right there in the patient care rooms. So as I'm treating a patient and, and counseling them on, on their viral URI, there's my face and my signature saying, I promise not to, to do it. So we adapted that for our urgent care center. Uh, and we had to adopt it or adapt the posters so that we had all the providers and all their signatures uh, on the same poster, English and Spanish. And, uh, to be able to, to celebrate the launch of it, we were able to bring in breakfast. We had our entire executive leadership in the room cheering them on as they signed the attestation. So making it fun, you know, showing our appreciation for the staff, uh, just empower them more and be uh, more accountable and more engaged. Uh, and we've seen some significant reductions in, in prescriptions there as well. Thank you so much for that description. I was so impressed the first time I heard about this initiative. And one of the things I know we've actually talked about even offline is that oftentimes when we work with um, new public hospitals or safety net centers that are delving into this work of value improvement, this barrier or wall comes up about, well, we don't have the resources to do all the technology and to do X, Y, and Z that various other institutions are doing. And what I'm so impressed is that knowing the resource limitations within LA County system, that it really wasn't the incentive of financial incentive that was driving. It really was addressing the culture and that culture of mission um, that exists. And so I really appreciate, you know, sharing, having shared that example. One question I have for you, which I think some of the listeners might be interested in is, 
what advice do you have for some of those, just as I described, other kind of safety net or public hospital systems just delving into this work that are bringing up some of those barriers as potentially issues, you know, which often come to staff bandwidth as well as financial incentives, kind of low resources all the way through and through. What advice do you have for them? So when I started at LA County USC, uh, it was almost seemed like an orientation to, to working in a county hospital was uh, other staff, more senior staff coming up to me and saying, don't think that you could change county. County will always be county. We've seen five or six different people before you come and we've spent our entire careers trying to change county. It's just always going to be that way. So that defeated that learned helplessness culture um, is common throughout a lot of safety net systems. So the first is allow or is working on that culture with leadership of saying, you know, that might have been true in the past, but we're not going to accept, you know, that as the, the answer now. Um, it is going to the front lines and saying, listening to their ideas um, and showing them that, you know, they can make a difference because change does not happen uh, in the ivory tower with the, the leadership. Um, change happens on the, the front line. And so the creating the environment where people feel like they have the psychological safety to raise their hand and say, we have issues here, but not only did I identify issues, I have ideas from my 20 or 30 years of working and doing the work uh, of how to make it better and really supporting that, you know, get that first win, celebrate that win. And then, you know, the, the culture completely changes to, uh, not another change from up above, but can we do this next? Can we attack this broken process next? And that was kind of the experience that, that I personally had with the new leadership team at LA County USC uh, with our, our various lean teams and the perioperative services and the emergency department choosing wisely initiatives. Um, it, it really, you have to, attack that deeply ingrained learned helplessness of, you know, don't just throw up your hand and say, woe is me, but what can we do about it and let's work on it together. Um, definitely, you know, the celebrating the wins, even if it is a potluck, you know, those you know, don't cost very much. Um, even if it is leadership bringing in breakfast or a small pizza party or a cake, uh, to celebrate 100% hand hygiene compliance on a unit. Uh, those are, those are low-cost ways of showing recognition um, and celebrating wins. That's great. And I think one of the things that kind of rings through from what you're saying is that there's a real vision and a, like a directive strategy for proactive appreciation of the staff no matter what level they were at. And I, I think that's really interesting and something that can be leveraged beyond financial incentives and, and some of those other um, kind of incentives that are out there. Another, another question that I, I, I am interested in is um, to ask you with the, these initiatives that you've done um, at LA County, did you have um, the patient's voice at the table um, either during the planning or kind of how was that integrated in? And if not, because oftentimes um, for various reasons, um, you know, programs don't have the patient necessarily in the planning room. Um, what advice from your experience working within the system would you have for others um, to deal with some of the issues in, in reducing low value care for populations that sometimes have issues with trust with the healthcare system and the idea that you know, there may be conversations where patients are asking for X, Y, Z, and the system is moving towards not doing that extra imaging or whatever that might be. Yeah, so thank you for asking that question. That was something that our uh, Choosing Wisely grantee group was thinking about. And so we did a survey with the patients in the waiting room for the urgent care center. Um, and we had our, our suspicions that, you know, maybe the safety net system is going to be more demanding maybe they're less educated they're going to come in and ask for all this you know low low value care uh 
our results did not pan out that there was any difference in expectations. Some of the surprising findings were where they got their information about yourself or myself or our family. If we have a, a medical question, you know, naturally we're going to probably go to the internet on our phones, on our computers, Google, you know, WebMD. Uh, but a lot of the, the safety net patient population, especially the older um, patients, they said that they get most of their information both from their doctor as well as the, the things that are lying around in the waiting room. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if, without asking them for their input, you might be thinking nobody ever looks at those brochures out there in the waiting room anymore. We should clean up the clutter and, and get rid of that. And so both, you know, that survey with the urgent care center, uh, with our, our periop lean team, um, every change that we made, we would go and do surveys with the, with the patients. Mm -hmm. you know, is there uh, any improvement from the last time that you needed to have a procedure here? Uh, so definitely want to get the patient's voice and engagement there. Uh, but I don't believe that the patients themselves are more demanding um, for low value care or any of those things, they just want to be heard and you know, they want their doctor to listen to them and explain things to them. So the same that you would do for any other patient. Mm -hmm. That's great. In a sense, it's, um, it's another potential barrier that's demystified, you know, that they're, it's not that different and, and you just have to get out and start doing the work in a sense. Um, I know that we're right around time, but I wanted to ask you one more question before we wrap up, which is, you know, if you could talk to yourself when you first started doing this, now having had all this experience, what advice would you give yourself um, when launching into you know, taking on these types of initiatives? Uh, I think, so when I was being recruited to LA County USC, I was coming out of University of Michigan, um, which is where I trained in emergency medicine but also where I, where I grew up in an environment of uh, being a quality safety risk leader in healthcare as well as lean. And I had a mentor who just happened to be interviewing me, uh, tell me it's great that you got all this training and performance improvement and lean. Uh, you don't want to go to Toyota and try to you know, make them better. You want to come somewhere where you're going to make a big difference for a lot of patients. Uh, and that's been my experience working in the safety net is that for a patient population that I believe uh, is most deserving and I'm so appreciative to make big differences, uh, improvement in, in the quality and the safety of their care. Uh, but this type of work can be very frustrating, you know, especially in a, in a culture of, of no, of we, won't, we don't want any more change. Uh, and so I, my advice would be to be patient uh, with yourself uh, and another uh, great piece of advice that one of my mentors, um, Dr. Brad Spellberg, the CMO at LA County USC told me is I always uh, on one-on-ones would say, I feel like I'm not going fast enough. I feel like I'm not doing enough. Um, his advice was the only way that you would let the patients and myself down is if you push so hard that you burn yourself out that you end up giving up or dropping out and then all those good things that you've already done as well as you will do in the future are, are lost. So I think it's being patient with yourself, staying true to, to the philosophy of performance improvement, of rapid cycle um, PDSAs, and you learn from those. Don't try to change the world all at once. And, uh, you know, just keep up the good work. Great. Well, thank you so much for, you know, coming today to discuss with us some of the work that you've been doing and providing this really useful advice. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you for having me.